Uh, today is Thursday, December 9th, 2021. We're at 1111 Somerset Avenue, Old Town Hall. Uh, this is a remote participation Zoom meeting, a hybrid meeting. Also live being recorded for cable broadcast and internet posting on www.dighton-mass.gov and YouTube. Zoom meeting number 830. 2139-2658, Zoom meeting passcode 137-908. Zoom dial-in number 929-205-6099. Uh, we began our evening this e uh, meeting this evening at 5 o'clock with a workshop which wasn't televised, uh, no Business was acted upon. It was discussion regarding some regulations okay. and, uh, excuse me? Proposed regulations. Proposed regulations, yes. We made no decisions or take no votes. So, but we will stand, if you don't mind, pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty. Thank you, everyone. First order of business is to review, discuss, and act. Board of Health member job description and posting. Um, we talked about the job description last meeting, and I think we agreed uh, with the final product. Uh, we had a couple of changes I think that we wanted to see. However, there was, I don't know what happened, but after my meeting with the town administrator, uh, I thought he understood we still had to do one more approval from the board because we added minimum housing standards. Uh, well, the job hook got posted yesterday. Uh, I don't know why, but it did. Uh, without the minimum housing standards. I guess we've got two choices. We can either add it after the fact when the job is filled, or we can repost the job and put it in there. I myself would rather see this move along, and we, we just put it in uh, later on. So we're going to lose a few more days, and we need another member, Kev. Yeah, so I don't know what your feeling is. Uh, and then even then, the, the training that's involved has the housing training as well. And doesn't it say somewhere it talks about um, public health matters? Or public health what? Anything with public health matters? And public health statutes. Yeah, statutes. That's one of them. So. Yeah, a lot of this will be covered anyway with the uh, some of the educational requirements, I, yeah. I think, that are coming up. So uh, I don't have a problem myself with leaving it posted as is. So uh, it's supposed to be coming down on December 22nd. Uh, we can have a meeting on December 24th if you want to go. <laughs> but no, we're not going to do that. Now, this is only until June 30th anyway, so obviously come July 1st, you could add in the housing into the description. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so what's your pleasure? You want to leave it as is? Yeah, I do. yeah, all right. We can we can do that. I don't think we need a motion for that because we've already approved I think the. We've gone above and beyond because I've never seen enough uh, a job description for a, a member of the board. Oh, you've never seen one? Never mind. You can have it. Copy it. For an agent, yes. But for a member, never seen it. But I'm so I'm glad we did it. Uh, yeah. Because, because we are actually adding training to it, and a lot of times. Um, you pull teeth to get somebody to get some training. So, you know where that most of that came from. I mean, we added some stuff in, but the organizational committee nice. that we had that you and I were on, from the, yeah, from the, a lot yeah. of that came out of that, and I pieced stuff together from uh, various resources. So, um, that's good. Okay, moving on to number four B. Uh, introduction of our. Town nurse, Nicole Mello. Uh, 
to date. I, I find her to be very, very capable of doing the work of the town nurse, uh, especially after last night's meeting with the Board of Selectmen. Uh, she's been starting on contact tracing. I don't know how you're doing with that, but we're going to find out here in a minute. You're going to let us know what's going on, uh, how you doing. And um, would you? I know you were introduced at the uh, Board of Selectmen meeting, but if you don't mind doing it again at our meeting, that would be great. No, I, I wasn't. I, I know you don't do public speaking, <laughs> but, uh, oh. you know, I don't either. Nobody likes doing it, but uh, so how are things going? Let's just ask you a few questions. All right. Things are moving along all right? Yes, yes. Okay. It's going very well. Okay. A lot of work starting to catch up with you? Yeah, but, I mean, it was to be expected. I started at a time where the CD... CTC was ending and the holiday was coming, so. No, okay. It wasn't. So no, you never anything. Just reach out. You know that. I'm sure Todd and Roz have told you. So, it's. Uh, they are beyond help. Very happy to have you on board. And we haven't formally met. I want to. I want to welcome you. Thank you, Kevin. And, uh, anyone that takes a position like this at this time uh, during COVID, I, I commend you. I watched you in action yesterday. Uh, compelling stuff, and you handled yourself very well. Um, look. Very professional, so very good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'd say echo the same thing. She's doing a great job so far. I know it's only been a couple weeks, but she's done everything that she needed to do to keep things moving along. So. Good. We'll keep, we'll keep you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, since I'm here. <laughs> Who, who's going to do the uh, COVID-19 contract chasing so, number 4C? Are you, are you taking that, or is Todd taking that, no. or both oh, of you? Well, I'm, I've been doing the contact tracing. Um, are you looking for numbers? Like, what kind of information? Yeah, just kind of like a brief, without giving obviously information. Yeah, well, I had, like, two days ago, I had numbers of, like, who, like, how many I had contacted, yeah. how many I hadn't contacted, but that's all out the window, because <laughs> yeah. I've received so many since then that... <laughs> well, for an idea, is it, is it trending up? Oh, or? yeah, yeah. And about 10 a day, I think I'm getting, and that's just um, that I'm accessing in Maven. That's not the schools um, contacting me. Um, yeah. And I did not think about, like, um, the other schools, um, BP, um, who else just reached out to me, Bishop Fian. I was like, I need to write down how many more there, there possibly could be coming out of their woodworks. I, I would love um, to hear that you guys actually contact the, uh, the other health department and have a meeting every, every week. Every week, so that's really good. So we do this every week. We've been doing it for a long time now, and it's worked great for the yeah. nurses. This year, we expanded it to include the Rehoboth Board of Health and the Rehoboth nurses, which was very helpful, especially for the high school. Obviously, we moved the whole into it. But then when we started doing the test and stay program, we started bringing the company that's doing that, that program in to sit in on the meetings, because they needed to know, because they were doing some things that we didn't like. Um, the, the, the man that was on there, he said, it's like, this is amazing. He said, you people are so far ahead of all the other school districts with doing this yeah. and being on top of your game. He said, you are so far ahead. He said, this is great. Just meeting and then discussing. Yeah, he was going to yeah, take it to other towns to yeah. have them start doing it because it was so effective. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's still effective. It worked very well. Although a lot of times there's stuff that comes up in the meeting that is a concern to us that we can't do anything about, so we have to have the district nurse bring it to the higher ups to, to implement some changes and stuff, and that was part of the reason for the selectmen meeting last night was to discuss some issues that homeowners have or, or residents have about their children and, and how we can work that forward. So, well, let me ask. The, let me ask a tough question. With all this going on, how are we doing with numbers, like for hours and stuff? Are we going to be all right? That was a question I was <laughs> I had well, um, because I don't want to. We budget, extend myself and then come and then we budgeted an additional five thousand dollars at the special town meeting which boosted our hours from 80 to 206 or something like that wasn't it there was a, an increase in our hours um which is helpful the other thing that happened is on december 3rd they announced a four million dollar grant for contract tracing 
it'll most likely be put out through SEP or MAHD like we did last time, and we'll just get a check for it. Just like the first two rounds, if you remember last April, or uh, April, May of 2020, when all this started, that's when those came when out. When did that get approved? December 3rd. So the time to like, between what we're doing here, just try to monitor it. Obviously, we want you to keep doing. No, no, I understand. Later on, we're going to have to, the question's going to come up for yeah. sure of hours and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, we are budgeting it all, and it's being tracked separately like, for our overtime. It's yeah. being tracked separately, and so we, we are tracking it all. So. Oh. oh. Do we need one, or am I good? <coughs> I think we're good. Okay. Yeah, I guess you can turn it off I, if you want. I, <laughs> The question I have on that, I just became aware of this now, um, are we gonna be able to recover the expense that we've already spent with the two of you from the overtime line? They, since have, they have not released information on that grant yet, but okay. usually they are retroactive, but I would assume it would start around that December 1st mark when CTC ended and the town had to pick it up. So I'm assuming it would be retroactive. That's when we seven. picked it up around then, right? Well, that was when CTC started, right, so we right. had to pick up. But we picked up a couple weeks before that, even, because that was, yeah, so. So we don't know if we're, we don't know. if it's going to get. Uh, we, we should be fine between what we have budgeted and, and that money when it comes to it. But Kevin, to answer your question, in the last 14 days, we've had 100 cases reported through Maven. Wow. There's been at least dozens reported through test and stay. There's home tests that are not being reported anywhere. Of the cases, approximately 50% are vaccinated people and 50% are not. Um, the highest age group that is getting it is 40 to 60. The next highest group is 0 to 19. Everybody else is a distant third. So, yeah. if those answer some of the questions you It does, ask. yeah. And what about those home tests? Are they reliable? I don't know what their, their rate is. I, am, I know what the PCR is like 92% reliable, but I'm not sure about the home. Um, tests. Well, there's a lot of variables that go into the people taking it. So. Yeah, because you get to take into account, are they doing it correctly? Um, it's true, like, yeah. A lot of uh, errors there. Things like that. And the schools, we talked about that. The um, home tests, the schools are requiring them to go get a PCR test. They're just not taking the parents' yeah. word for it. So, yeah, there's a lot of... Um, that came up last night. Yeah. So, yeah. I almost finished your section. I love the, the video. I was right at the end of it. Well, it wasn't sure. Very long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Nicole just had to keep talking, so. I was very excited. <laughs> All right, so every day is a grind, and the numbers are going up. Um, oh, the, the other thing that has, is starting again is the fire department, police department has asked that we give them a list of addresses that have COVID. Like we did back when it was before, we've gotten away from it because so few cases. Um, but they want to know. So starting tomorrow, I'm going to run a list for them um, and try and get them up to speed on that. The problem is there's a lot of addresses right now. But. Mm -hmm. So I, I was thinking before we had, um, we were helping individuals uh, get the vaccine with rides and stuff. Are we helping them get the booster? Or are we just kind of let them go on their own after that? Um, as of right now, nobody's asked that question. Uh, presumably, if they had call us, we would get them a ride where they need to go. Yeah, so we got them halfway there, and then uh, <laughs> now they need the rest. We got to maybe reach out to them? Yeah, that hasn't come happening, but we do have our list from the homebound from before, and um, we can reach out to them. Yeah. We can have our nurse do it. Don't overwhelm her. We want to keep her. <laughs> yeah. No, but it wasn't that long of a list. It was only, you know, whatever. We'll, we'll give them a call. We'll figure it out. And do what you can. Just try not to get overwhelmed. It's a tough time. Just do what you can, and uh, I'm sure you're gonna do great. Thank you. And we told her where where her safety net um, to help when she needs it. So. Same thing, Lori. When she needed us, she just called all the time. Sometimes she just needed to call to uh, get a good lap in because we just you need to let the stress out somehow because otherwise yeah. it comes out. Just come in. Time. You'll get a laugh. <laughs> um, while we're talking about COVID and, and the stress of all of this, this was given to me last week by Todd. And, and it's something I kind of been saying for the last couple of months on supporting staff well being during the COVID uh, pandemic. And the average person, 
I think, uh, is under a lot of stress uh, from having to do this contact tracing. Uh, number of hours, the, uh, the discussion with the people who are ill or family members that are ill. But anyway, this was on a DPH side, DPH, Department of Public Health for Mr. Higgins, that um, was on a webinar, one of the webinars, correct? So supporting staff well-being. And so everybody's aware of this. You and your staff are also human beings living through a pandemic, just like your cases and contacts. Be aware of signs of emotional distress. Acknowledge and discuss in staff meetings. Inform staff of mental health coverage and resources available. Create an environment that promotes well-being. Opportunities for staff to take breaks. Opportunities for staff to connect with colleagues and be aware of vicarious trauma, trauma symptoms that can result from repeated exposure to others' difficult situation. Staff members are bearing witness to stories of grief, grief loss, unemployment, financial and housing insecurity resulting from the pandemic. Thank you guys for what you did. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, it's not easy. I'm aware of it. And uh, this is why we try to discuss, and any time you need to discuss something, uh, come on in and, you know. As a matter of fact, we, we've been trying to have staff meetings on Monday morning, mm -hmm. uh, sometime about 10 or 11. If you want to come in and we can discuss what's going on, uh, you know, you don't have to if you want to. I, I would like to see you there. Yeah, they they last that. about half hour, if that, 15 yeah. minutes just to get us up to date of what's going on and how everybody's doing. Yes, in general terms, it's not we're talking about this case or this, this, mm -hmm. this project. It's just in general like, terms of like, how busy are we, where do we need help, that kind of thing. Okay. Thank you. And even if you do it on, you call in, we can do it, we can do it that way too. Okay. On a field do-over, we can do that too, even if you want to do the video call. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to read that out for whoever's watching. Uh, it's not as easy as it looks it is uh, to try to get all this accomplished uh, with the people who are in the midst of the pandemic or who have been infected. So it's, it's pretty difficult. Anyway, moving on. Kevin, did you want to say something? Yeah, no? Just like same thing. Uh, thank you. Well, I, just, man, I don't know if we have... Colton wants to stay for anything else. I don't know if there's anything else here that is uh, of um, concern or first. Yeah, you don't. If you want to bug out, you can. Yeah, I have calls to make. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unless there's something else you wanted to bring up to the board's attention? Um, no, I didn't see anything about the flu clinic, but um, I didn't know if that needed to be. Yeah, you should mention that because I last I knew you were contacting. Uh, well, we're pretty much set up, correct? Yeah, so it's going to be, um, like the sign says, December 18th, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, I know that the Board of Health said that they would help um, schedule people. Um, we have the little flyer that has the QR code that can be used. Um, I had seen something else where there was a link. Um, just go in there. There's all these slots where you can plug somebody in that calls. Um, go through the questions and plug them in there, or they can do it themselves. You have a phone, you just take a picture of that that um, thing and it will pop up. Um, they ask that you bring in an insurance card. Um, and if you don't make an appointment and you go by and you're like, oh, hey, I'm, today's the flu clinic, you can just pop on in. It's not required to have a Any an activity yet that you know of? Uh, Sorry, what? Any activity, is any? How many people? Oh, no, I, I only looked the other day, and it was just um, nobody. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think a lot of people have already had their shots, but, you know, it's yeah. tough for people who, it's good for people who can't travel long distances yeah. or uh -huh. even short distances. I mean, it, it's here. It's convenient. So A lot of providers got the um, vaccine a little late this year, so I'm hoping maybe some people okay. weren't able to get it because of they got it late, so maybe we they'll. We could probably notify all the staff, too. That we have, I'll just remind them. 
Yeah, they, they didn't send anything out to the town hall. We can have... Um, just in case nobody got it, yeah. Yeah, they should. Then this way they could tell their family members and whoever. So That's in this building, correct? Yes. Yes, we'll okay. Be in here. I don't want to be the only one that gets... Like, uh, we'll probably myself. come and help you out here. <laughs> yeah. So, Selectman Hall will be here. Okay. He doesn't do anything on Saturdays. <laughs> okay. Well, All thank right, you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks. Let me you again. Have a good night. Okay, 4D, uh, someday we're going to complete this, but it's probably not going to be tonight because I was hoping that uh, Commissioner Agya could be here because I had asked him to be part of it since he is an agent of the Board of Health. Do you want to table it for a few minutes? Yeah, we can just table it, and if he comes in before the end of the meeting, we can, we can discuss it. Um, Moving on to... Do you need a motion to table? No. Or? Moving on to 4E then. Resident handbook of what to expect when installing, repairing, or upgrading a septic system. Oh, look at this. Now, this is in draft form, <clears throat> not official. So this is something that uh, Ros and I put together. Um, it's meant to be a colloquial way of letting a regular homeowner know what's kind of involved in the process from start to finish. Um, it may be too long, too short, missing steps. Again, it was what we put together and we felt it was pretty comprehensive, but it may be, let's say it's colloquial, so it's, it's yeah. not meant for an engineer, it's not meant for an installer, it's meant for a homeowner who doesn't know anything about the process. And how would you, just wondering, I know we're still going to go through it, and how would you get it, like, how would you get it to them? Um, well, some people call us. We would also have it on our website. Um, we would probably have engineers provide it to the people when they call. And engineers may end up starting to use this for projects outside of Dayton, but, yeah. um, and have them disseminate it to the, the homeowners. I don't know of any other way to really get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Title five inspection, we could then, if it, you know, fails, we could reach out to them that way. Because I was thinking, as soon as, like, when, when you have a Title V inspection as a fail, you send out a letter, correct? Mm -hmm. oh. So well, normally I would send out a letter just saying, your Title V was, uh, is, is your Title V inspection indicated it was failed? You have, and then you give the time frame. Uh, please contact the office. But then you could also say, please see this, because it says, number two says, hire an engineer. They don't know that they... If somebody was already working on their plan, they wouldn't have to go to number two. But on a Title V failure, okay. they would know, oh, I need to hire an engineer. Sometimes they're calling us before we get the failure. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah a we lot of times we don't, get, we don't even have the report in, and they're asking. But this is doing. excellent because yeah, you can refer them to those questions. How, how did you work? The, by, did you generate this from questions that are normally asked well, of you? Um, I, I've been doing this as an engineer for a really long time, and what happened is the same, every homeowner is asking the same questions over and over again. So we put together what was effectively a, a, a FAQ for these homeowners, and it worked great because people, instead of, hey, before I spend an hour talking to you, we're going to mail you something, read it, and then after you read it, call and we'll talk because this explains a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. It really set aside a lot of the time on the phone because they were able to read it. When we came here and we talked about doing this as part of the whole um, making the board more transparent and all that, um, I took that and modified it into a document that was meant. It included a lot more than what I used to have in there too because there's a lot more of this stuff now too than there used to be. So, um, but it's it I modified off of that. But yes. It's same questions all the time by homeowners. And generally engineers field the questions um, because they are the point person usually for a homeowner as they go through the process. But yeah, you wouldn't think. I mean, I didn't give it any thought. 
because I'm probably aware of it. And they may have to take down your fence or they may dig up your yard. Uh, people aren't aware of this. They just think you get in there, dig a hole, and yeah. that's the end of the story. They don't realize the disruption it's going to cost and the, you know, how it's going so to. Just the tracks alone of the, the yeah, back. Yeah. They're like, so, oh, my yard's a mess. Well, how'd you think we're going to get here? Yeah, I'm gonna, we'll look over this, and I think there may be some things. I saw some towns have uh, similar what to expect when doing this, but this is great. Uh, I think we'll take this one under advisement, maybe. Yeah, and, and then I, um, I like to review the whole thing. I'm thinking after the first of the year, Roz, we need a, like a two-hour workshop. Yeah. <laughs> On a, yeah, yeah, on a separate night to like get by Like we did today, when we stuff. banged out one, we jumped to the other one. Yeah, because, you know, this has got to get done sooner than later, and uh, hey, the only yeah. way we're going to do it is, is have a off-night workshop. Our January meeting is the 13th, so at that meeting, you could schedule once we get past the first of the year, and you know what your schedule is going to be like, because I know it's hard to say now. And then that would still give us two full weeks and a couple of days in January to try and do a workshop. Yeah. Unless you want to try and schedule it tonight. Yeah, it's, a, it's a Thursday, right? Well, normal meeting is the second Thursday. Well, the problem is people coming in behind us and we're getting shoved out sooner than they want to leave. Uh, and we have to rush through some items I'd like to discuss more and more. Um, so if we, Wednesday nights work the best, honestly, for me. I don't know about for you. Yeah, Wednesday nights are tough. Um, since I seem to get, keep going to select the meetings. Um, why, don't, why don't you check and see who's coming in on Thursdays behind us? Just the con con meets on Thursday. Well, the third Thursday is the con con. Yeah. yeah. So we could do the first. Well, the second should have been open. Tonight should have been open. This other meeting we didn't know about. Yeah. Except, so. Yeah, but even if we did the um, 20th, which would be conservation, if we did five to seven, it should be two hours. Yeah, that would be good. Okay, so back to back weeks, the 13th. And then the 20th for the workshop, if there's no one here yet. Hey. Hi, sorry I'm late. That's okay. So 13th and the 20th? 20th will be 10th, I'll check to make sure there's nothing else. Okay. So, you want to make a motion to take item uh, 4E under advisement? So moved. Okay, I'll step down, second a motion. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Mr. Bernardo? Aye. And Mr. Pires is also an aye. Let's move to take this under advisement and we'll bring it up. Uh, I think this is a workshop item probably. Uh, Oh, yeah. for, for our next meeting okay. when we have the workshop. Yeah. Okay. A lot of reading to do. No, this is not oh, for that, yeah. Sorry. I mean. Oh. Next item is propane tanks. Uh, there's been a discussion of this ferry that um, we probably shouldn't be accepting propane tanks. Um, and we should only be taking the household hazardous waste tanks. So if you would like us to stop taking I'm thinking, what if we just notified the people that the gas must be out and the head, yeah, the yeah, head yeah. taken off? Well, if they do that, then they can just throw it in the metal there. But everybody's bringing them with it attached and with some gas still in the tank. Well, I don't want to totally shut them out. I mean, but. Well, they would just be keeping them till our yearly pump up and replacing. Well, that makes sense now. They can get rid of them for free. I know. 
So the thing is, if we ask homeowners and they have to start knocking those tops off, we could have other dangerous problems because they're not necessarily true. qualified for take, taking them off. Yeah, so. yeah. I have received an inquiry from a gentleman who asked about coming to the transfer station and getting them. Like he would come get rid of them for us, but Tom Ferry said, no, that's metal, like we want to keep those. But now if he's saying, no, we don't want them, and maybe we should reach out to that gentleman and see if he's done. I know, but that means we have to get into a contract with some guy. Okay, now it's a surplus product if we're having somebody take it. That's yeah, we'd have to go to bid. Yeah. It, it turns into a whole. Yeah. We're just thing. a random person. That's it, 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 there's a reason why we would want to stop taking them at this point in time, but at some point we may end up. When, when the decision. Like have to shed or whatever right, in order to be taking the stuff. Yeah. We've well, been doing your, this for years. How did this all of a sudden become. What was your experience with propane tanks? They always. I assume they always came in empty. <laughs> really? Now that I think, thought about it, I never thought they would come in and you'd. Uh, be open and what's the yeah only the person runs it out until it's de dead right yeah i don't know i i agree with todd though i'm not sure not that i think homeowners aren't capable but i would prefer not having homeowners taking propane tanks apart yes yes home. yes yeah. 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 yes please do not touch your propane tank so when is that household hazardous waste is it in the spring every year well, well we're shooting for the spring yeah, but then we're, we're, we, have have a certain day, amount, yeah. we have a certain amount budgeted, and that's going to... Yeah, but just an FYI, gentlemen, I reached out to four different companies for dates for the spring. No one has responded. Yeah, see? And now we're going to be... Including every... a company that reached out to us and said, hey, we want your business. We reached out to them and no response. <laughs> so. We sent it out. How long ago was that? A couple weeks ago. It was right after our last meeting. Can, we, can we just tell our attendant until we really come up with a plan? You show up with a tank. If it's not empty, you've got to take it back with you. It's got to be empty. Have we looked into a process for safely evacuating the propane from propane tanks? Is there a way that we can do that and recycle the propane? I mean, I don't know how much propane is yeah. coming in in these tanks, but how many propane tanks a year do we take in? 60 or 80. So if each one has a pound of propane in it, that's 60 pounds of propane. That's I know. a lot of propane. Like uh, uh, Freetown actually used the oil to right. run their um, DPW yeah, I, on I certain things. And I don't know what's entailed. I yes. Even, I, I yeah, the furnace. Know. The furnace. Yeah. So you talk yeah. about propane recovery from the tank. About propane recovery, and then we can maybe use it to heat uh, one of the buildings or something like that. I don't know. Um, uh, actually, not a bad idea. Well, then we know that the propane is being recovered and not being let out into the atmosphere, which is what's going to happen. Yeah. Very good. We want, want to talk to somebody. Want to talk to Tom? Or we can call him and see if he wants to join us at the meeting or not. <laughs> now let him eat. No, I'm <laughs> I don't think that's a bad idea to see what he thinks. Yeah, or in the meantime, talk to him, and then we can always circle back and... Yeah, I'll ask him about what's yeah, entailed okay. with propane recovery. That's something I don't think if the people that are already receiving it can do something, I don't think it needs our vote. If they're going to use it appropriately like Tom would be doing. We would need equipment and everything else. Like that's, we may going to need training. I mean, but he would want to stop taking propane tanks now. He does be one the board to vote to say no more propane tanks. Well, we, we, can, we can we can table it. But yeah, why don't we not? temporarily suspend the acceptance of them while we research propane recovery and alternative methods of disposal? When's our next meeting? Roz? I'm sorry. When's the next meeting? The 13th, January. 13th. Okay. Then, well, you're going to reach out to uh, well, the attendant? Being done on alternative methods of disposal. Reach out to who? The attendant. Oh, to let him know it's suspended? Yeah. yeah, and you notice the second page there is a signed piece of paper right here that signed a letter posting saying that we're 
Sure, we'll change it to temporarily suspending. We can change yeah, the word. So if somebody comes in, they already know and post it somewhere. So how about a motion to suspend it for 30 days until we uh, find out? Um, so move, 30, 30 days, so move. Okay. Uh, I'll step down, second a motion to suspend. Uh, all in favor? Mr. Bernardo? Aye. Mr. Pires is also an aye. Uh, motions passed to suspend acceptance of propane tax for 30 days. Uh, yeah, even if you could put on our website something, just get the message out and then assign at the thing. Town crier, whatever they want to do. Try to do something. I'm going to move back up to item 4D now that uh, the building commission is here. One of our one of our agents to the board of health. You want to pass these out, Ross? Yeah. Just so you know, Tom, it's 6:37, so we we have to be at uh, seven. No, Zoom is stopping at 7. Oh, okay. Zoom is stopping. Okay. Does people have a copy of what's in uh, presently yep. in Title V? I do. I got it. <laughs> yeah, if you want to. There's copies here. Do you get a copy of the this, Jim? I do. Thank you. Information and process. Thank you. Okay. That was taken uh, under advisement for now until we're going to have a workshop. I think I do, but that's okay. I have this for new construction. Now. It says Town of Dighton Title Five Septic System Repairs Information and Process. No, sir. I do not have that. Do you I have it? I don't get any more, Ross. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I got. No, uh, we only have the, I can print out another one. Okay. Just make sure you write draft on the top of it. Go home with oh my god. Load of paper. I thought we were gonna do new construction. This one. Okay. There's another piece of paper I want to. Discuss item four D. You discuss an act septic definition of new new construction. Um, no, Title five that. puts out a fairly definitive uh, definition of what new construction is. So it would seem to the average person like me who doesn't know a whole lot about. Title V. However, since I've been chairman, I found that there are various uh, circumstances that doesn't make this definition so cut and dried. And that's been a problem, well, since I've been here that I've found. And I think it's time that everybody gets on the same page so we can all, even the engineers and installers, so we can all have a general idea and be on the same page moving forward. Um, I know there's certain areas of Title V that do impact the basic definition, uh, 
such as increase in design flow or improved capacity. Now, and I'm gonna use a recent example of, if we don't know because there's no, uh, no as-built plan or no certificate of compliance that was ever issued, we don't know what the design flow was at the time. Um, I, I would seem to think if we don't know that and somebody's replacing a house where they had demolished it or whatever happened to it, uh, is that a repair or is that gonna be considered new construction with a new system? That's one area that I'm thinking about. Uh, if there's a house that was there and the foundation is gone, this, are we gonna call that new construction or repair? Uh, we've had a, I've seen places where probably the system was put in uh, on a farm recently that I can recall the person that owned the property found found an old septic system and came to the came to this meeting actually and we ended up calling it a repair, a repair. so I'm going to let you professionals who are very familiar with Title V uh, throw out what you think would impact the definition of new construction. So who wants to start? I'll, I'll go first. Obviously you can't change this definition. You can only add to it. So the definition, it is what it is. And then I like your points. If you were going to add to it, you would say that what's required um, would be either an as-built passing Title V um, or certificate of compliance. So if you don't have those things. Then there would be new construction. It wouldn't be. Was it all wouldn't be, yeah. Is it all three you were looking for? Either way, it'd be, it'd be, you'd have to demonstrate an as-built if there wasn't an as-built, a certificate of compliance. So somebody started the work, but walked away from it. Now they're demolishing the house. Ten years later, they say, look, I and we don't have any proof that the system was in. Uh, and even then, the, the other um, example you had mentioned, someone's knocking down the house, but the system is there, and instead of adding flow, somebody just does a Title V inspection and says, is this Dean, is it operating? We actually did have that the other. Uh, is, it, is it operating? Yes, it was operating. Then we can just build a house and introduce flow later to the house. But are you talking that so you only need one out of those three things? You need all three of those things? Because Title well, V requires you to have a COC to determine capacity. Well, on one of, like, for, there's different um, scenarios. So if my house, uh, something happened to my house, when I'm not selling it, why would I need a, um, as built, if it was already there, I was already living it, I would just need a Title V inspection. If I was selling my house, I would need a Title V um, and hopefully, in, when you, somebody looks at the Title V, there is an as-built and there is a certificate of compliance. Um, so, so we're talking, there's one example of where there'll, there'll be a difference of whether it's whether you're selling the house or keeping the house. So, so that's one, one thing that impacts uh, how we're going to consider this. So let me just say that Title V right now says you need a COC and a passing Title V. That's already written in Title okay. V. So the as built is the only thing that you're asking for that's above and beyond what Title V is asking for. It helps you make a determination. I understand that. But I'm saying that, that's all you're asking for above and beyond the new construction definition in Title V. I would say because it's kind of spelt out for me. Until you come across something that's totally a curveball, then you can always address it later on. But they kind of spell out each thing, e increase in flow, um, 
existing building. It just, it just, I don't know. Another point uh, I want to make is about the building in existence as of March 31, 95. Uh, this is in the definition, Title V, that uh, that's an exception to this, to the requirement. And that you can actually. That is considered new construction. Now. You can make it later, early, I mean. Yeah. Um, does that mean if the house is destroyed by an act of God or destroyed voluntarily by the homeowner? It doesn't say. Um, Correct. Generally, it's, if it's involuntarily destroyed is when you have the right to rebuild. But it doesn't say that, though. It doesn't. Not but that the, I, I said it doesn't say that. But, but to destroy a house, you need a demolition permit from you, right? Yeah. It, it specifically says partially destroyed. Destroyed is usually associated with some type of, a, of an event that you have no control over. The involuntary part, yes. Or demolished. Well, demolishing can be several ways. It can be demolished. So demolishing would be a voluntary act. To me, it doesn't prohibit that. And this date is chosen for obvious reasons. Yeah, because yeah, Title, Title five, 5, yeah. Act. Right. So you, if I understood what you said correctly, demolished would probably more than likely be a voluntary act. Correct. Okay. Even though it doesn't say it. that's destroyed by fire or um, natural causes. I never stood on it and said, gee, that storm demolished this structure, didn't it? No, it destroyed it. Yeah. Okay? And then if I want to However, demolish something, I come to see you. However, if, if, it, if it was damaged beyond repair, you know, and I needed to demolish it, you know, for my obligation, or if the property owner or insurance company demolished it, or... If it's gone beyond its serviceable lifespan, which does happen to buildings, and nobody maintained it, then it will be demolished voluntarily. Okay. But either way, in order for it to be not new construction, you need to have a certificate of compliance and a passing Title V inspection. So if you want to take your perfectly good house, tear it down, and build another one right there, as long as you've got a COC, which again, in today's world is not built to, and a passing Title V, you're good to rebuild it. Where does it say that? It does. Where? It says that above the existing approved capacity, and the next page, the definition of approved capacity is shown on the disposal works app or the certificate of compliance, whichever is less. So if you don't have a COC, that's a design of zero gallons per day. And it's whichever is less. So that implies you need a COC in order to be considered that you have a viable septic system. Yeah, because some people have started it, and then it collects dust. Well, we've had several that they've been installed, but never everybody pulled a permit or got a COC, so we have no proof that it was installed correctly. Sometimes a signature could be missed, and that's the worst thing, because a person's like, oh, if they have come up with other ways to verify, and you know it's not a cesspool. So basically what that definition says is if the water health is not involved with the installation of that system, it can't be reused. For... Or repair. It would have, you'd have to go to new construction. Correct. Okay. You I can continue to use it until you want to tear the house down. But yeah. I think that's somewhat amicable because there's no record of what's in the ground. Yeah. So we don't know what the design capacity or even the design criteria were. But you're assuming that it was what was on the plan, and you get a Title Five inspection that may or may prove that it may be there. But again, with no inspections, DEP says that there's no COC. Yeah. So we all know that Dighton's records including my departments, were fairly incomplete for many, many years. How often do you find properties that have one missing items, but a permit was pulled? Well, how many permits do we do a year here? 50-ish? So out of the 200, we've had two. No, historically, I'm saying that. Oh, no, but I'm saying that I, I don't... I couldn't tell you how many we've just took the permit without a thing. 
I mean, a lot of them are cesspools too from the old days, but cesspools we automatically have as an automatic mm -hmm. So that's. I would hate to penalize a homeowner mm -hmm. if they try to do the right thing and we don't have the proper records. But if we don't have an ASBUILT or a COC or anybody even pulled a permit to put the system in, we don't know that. Yeah. Because yeah. at least, at least there's a permit but no signature. Right. The Title V inspector can verify that, oh yeah, wait, you're saying this is here, but it's not here, this is a cesspool here. Forget it. But the problem is we can't be less restrictive than Title V. We can no, only be more. I, I, so. I, I, yeah. And this is why I've held to, if I don't have an as built on file or a COC, it's new construction. Regardless of what we do, you're always gonna run into these. I know, there's always a barrier. No matter what definition we come up with today, there's, there's always gonna be that one, one that's gonna, you're gonna scratch your head on. Well, I'm, I guess I don't want a definition. I'm just looking that we all agree on the same uh, definition, I guess it is a definition. Uh, what factors affect whether it's new construction or repair? And what do you need in an, in an older place, which I think we have the COC as built in Title V, that we said? It, it, it helps you make that decision. That's what I'm saying. It makes oh, it, most definitely does. Maybe it makes, no. it makes you, uh, because I've only seen it, only once in a great while somebody knocks on the house and they want to keep the system. But obviously we've dealt with fires or whatever it is. We, uh, we do the Title V anyways because the yard was just flooded. We want to make sure they didn't drive over it. Whatever, we just want to make sure that is operating properly. Then yes, please build your house again and recover from that disaster. But you don't want to spend all the money in the house and then and have a system that's going to fail within a year. So, so I'm just going to throw an example. Um, we have a place. We knew there was a house there. The house is gone. The foundation's gone. System's there. We find... Uh, it wasn't that long ago. It was uh, pre-95, let's say. Okay. I'm sorry. Let's say it was after 95. Post-95. After 95. Yeah. <laughs> is that new construction or is that going to be a repair? Because he also needs, I think it's over here, occupancy permit. Oh, that's the better, that's the better, uh, that, oh, yeah, definition of construction when an occupancy permit is required. How would you go about that, if you know, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but would you add flow to that system to see if it's operating? Well, I think is you're it, assuming that the septic system won't pass Title V, which I think is a problem. Well, I'm just saying it's abandoned, what happened? The, the, the building that was post-1995, and I can conduct a Title V inspection and find some paperwork on it, then I think that system is subject to a Title V inspection. Absolutely. Now, if you're asking me as a Title V inspector, would I add flow to a system that hasn't received flow? Yes, I would add flow to a system that received flow, but my Title V report would say that normal flows did not run to the system prior to the inspection. For that, for that yeah. Right. Even then, even, with, even then, adding even 330 with, gallons, what's that going to prove? Well, even with each inspector can, can choose the own amount of water they would add, um, I have my, my ways of, of coming up with how much flow I, I would add to a system based on the bedroom count. However, that doesn't constitute normal flows to a system. Absolutely. But I also don't think a property should be penalized if it, if it passes a Title V inspection by a competent inspector. I don't think that that person should have to replace the system just because there isn't a plethora of information on it. Yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what I'm looking for. Almost like if you did the Title V inspection, you're going to add some kind of asbestos, even if it's a drawing right. that kind of goes with that paperwork. Right. But if there's really nothing on that end, you wouldn't be able to do your job anyways. Right. Yeah, after 95, there should be. There should be something, yeah. and hopefully you're going to run into maybe that case. But I think a Title V inspection with something documented, and you can locate the system, and it's not... Um, accessible, whatever it is, that's our failure. Now, I think we should clarify my statement that I made would be if the proposed structure did not increase the flow based on the 
based on whatever records are available. And in the absence of a, of a design plan, if you go to the assessor's records, what historically has this house or structure had in it for bedrooms? And that's how you base the Title V inspection, and that's how you base the flow test. Now, I can understand Todd's document, argument that, well, there's some unknowns there if we don't have a design plan. I get that. But we can't presume that everybody who put a septic system in without a, without a formal plan did it incorrectly or didn't do a good job. If that's what we're trying to do, then um, I think it's going to warrant a public hearing or something before we write that regulation. Because that's going to force a lot of people to change systems. Well, again, that's, that's Title V. Title V says that. That's not yeah. what we're talking about. We're talking about do we go beyond what they're saying? And do you require an as built? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That, that needs a public hearing if we're yeah. going to do that. Yeah, I think, if, I think when a, a case like that would come, you would, you would invite the individual in. And then you could just try to figure out, hash it all out because you'd say, I'm just thinking that person would have no record of any permit, um, no record of, record of as built. And then the Title V inspector can't even do a comprehensive inspection because. Or even if they can, say so they can do one and they can find the tank, find the D box. But then they don't know a year, they don't know a year if it was after, before 1995. They don't know what kind of, they could see the tank and the condition of the tank, wow. right? There, there are ways to date a system based on the components that you find in the ground. You can get it pretty close. <coughs> I mean, we know when 900 gallon tanks were used, we know when 1,000 gallon tanks were used, we know when 1250s were used, and we know when 1500s were used. So you can kind of figure out what date the system went in the ground, or at least the tank. Yeah. We What's also that? know that if you've got PVC piping in the field, we know that's probably after 1970. Before that would be Orangeburg piping. So there are ways that you can date a system without paperwork. And believe it or not, I would find a lot of times the, the document that I was looking for would be in the building department instead. Yeah, that's not the case here. I'm just saying. You would find something that, right. especially if you're looking for a phone number. Well, the People give the phone number to the building department, but they don't give it to the Board of Health. <laughs> I mean, I say that's not. I, I don't have septic files in my building permits, um, rarely. But yeah, I think a good inspector, if there's not much information at the Board of Health, will, will exhaust all avenues to try and find out what's available for that property. Yeah, because it could be an addition that they were draw, I mean, wrote up for a permit, but they drew something else that looked like a, the, the whole property. So you might get lucky. So what's our ultimate goal here with this discussion? Because if they're upgrading, if they're increasing flow, Title Five talks of that. That's black and white. That's black and white. Um, if it's a brand new house and it's a, it's a vacant lot, that's black and white. Yep. Um, if it's a house that's for sale that doesn't pass Title V, that's black and white. So we just focused on buildings that are either demolished or destroyed. Well, I was on a perk on Hart Street, and um, there used to be a system there. And a house. And a house. No knowledge of where it was going to, whether where the house was, or there was a foundation. We I found think. some stone remnants of the foundation. No idea where the system was. Where you think it was down towards the front, and they wanted to call it uh, a repair. No, it was no information, right? On anything to do with the type of system, even or where it was, right? Now, because just because the house was there previously and there was a septic system that we didn't know where it was, I don't see how that can be a repair. So I, I said it was new construction and I wanted four holes and two parts because they couldn't even find the test pits that they had done years ago when they had talked, you know, tried to do development. So I called it new construction um, in that case because there were no records whatsoever of anything. No building permits, no nothing. Do the assessors have records of the structure being on the property? We're going back a long time ago. But, but even the assessor, then. The assessor in this town keeps great records. So yeah, I, I didn't go back in time. But again, so, so say 30 years ago, there was a two-bedroom house there. Mm -hmm. Or say a three-bedroom house. Does that mean it should be repaired now? I know there was a house here. The house was raised years ago, and it was, uh, it was really in deplorable condition. I mean, as far as structurally. So the only difference by calling it a repair and construction is that you do less holes, and you have the uh, um, flexibility of waivers from Title V. Correct. So, um, I guess.
guess my question would be, what would, if someone was to prove that there was a structure on the property, what's the harm of calling it a repair? You could actually go out with them and do the inspection with them. Like when, he's out, when you say, when you get your Title V inspector, I'll go out there and verify it with you. Right, so by calling it a repair and not new construction, that means we would have to have some kind of record of the septic system. We don't know what the septic system is. We don't know what kind it is. There's no records at all. So all we would have is an assessor's field card that says it was a three-bedroom house 30 years ago. That's the only record we have. I think, with due respect, I think we're talking about two different things. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so I was referring specifically to what the chairman was just describing, which was on, on Hot Street. So in that particular situation where there may have been a pro property, they didn't do a Title V inspection because nobody could find a system. They know they're going to design a septic system, but they asked to design it in repair because the building had already been, the because property had already been improved yes. upon. What would the harm be with doing a, considering that a repair instead of new construction? Well, when you do a repair, then you have to prove your hardship for why you need waivers. And in this case, <coughs> it would be a hardship because you're rebuilding the entire lot from scratch. So effectively, you're meeting the new construction rates anyway, whether you call it a repair or new construction. So the only difference is the two extra holes, which again, I don't see what the, the hardship is to say, I'm, I only need to dig two holes. And then you're talking like a $100 fee extra. So, right? $100, $300 two, extra. $200. Is it $100 more? Oh, two hundred. No, so $200 more, so. Because right. ex um, obviously there was an existing system there. There had to be. It was yeah. probably a cesspool if it was a rubble foundation, but it was still improved upon, mm -hmm. so. I don't know. Um, well, again, no matter what, what what we come up with for a definition, there's always going to be another one that's got a different thing. And you're right, we can use field records from the assessors to say, yes, there was a house there, there was a barn, there was a shed, whatever it may be. I can see a property owner's um, argument, and I'll, I'll tell you specifically with, with what I have enforcement over. If someone comes to me and says, you know what, I, I had this property, it was improved upon, it was not held in common ownership, there was a structure on it, there's some leniencies granted by Mass General Law for that property. Allows them to reconstruct on it, even if it doesn't meet the current standards. So I could see why someone would, would have that or make that argument that they feel they should have some protection, even under Title V. Um, I suppose it's up to the, the board if they, if they want to be more stringent, they can be. I'm just asking what the harm is, so. We're working on a Regs, anyways, this would be added to. Yes, this would be part of the regs. Yeah. Okay. The proposal. Yeah, we're not going to do a separate definition for new construction. And then yeah. Do the regs later. It would be part of it. There's so many variations. I, I'm starting to lean toward what uh, Mr. Bernardo said before that about coming into the ward and demonstrating or showing all the paperwork that's there or, or what the situation is and then we can make a decision or the board can make a decision or at least listen to what. Well, it's not like it happens every day, but you're going to get one or two. It seems like it's fairly infrequent for yeah. the most part, um, but, but I, there have been some that have come up. So I, I, think, that's, I think that's a reasonable solution. Instead I, of Instead of trying to write a rule that we know isn't going to work for everybody, yeah, no. it might be a better solution to say, you know what, if there's, if, there's, if there's an applicant who says, you know what, I think it should be a repair, and here's why. You have valid arguments. I'm not saying you don't, okay? Because ultimately, we're trying to protect the soil, uh, the, the groundwater. And, and giving someone a waiver on, on a property that hasn't had a building on it for 50 years, I, I get it. I totally do but I think maybe it would be up to the applicant to come to the board and show them whatever evidence they have and then let the board uh, figure it out. Yeah. yeah, normally I think in the decision is made by the health agent and it should be uh, taking into everything into consideration. But I, I also think if there's strong opposition against why it's considered new uh, construction or repair, that's the time when it probably should come to the board. Uh, but most people, I think, will realize, well, you know, I get the point once it's explained to them why we're calling it new construction. Um, 
we're open up more worms, cans of worms, I think, by trying to add or do something with this definition that already exists. That's one other question. Is there a difference between, uh, you know, well, repair is any perk rate, right? And new construction is what? 30. So that would be the only thing that would be um, an applicant's, to the applicant's benefit if a property had bad soils and they could convince, if they convince the board, then fine, the board is convinced. But that would be the other benefit, would be that you don't have to meet the 30 minute perk rate under repair either. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is too, is if you don't call it new construction and there's a system, we'll say it's some kind of tank, thousand gallon tank with a pit or two pits after it. If it passes a Title V inspection, they can just rebuild the house. Like, and you're not getting a repair done, you're not getting any septic, they can just tie into it if it's not new construction. But if it passes Title V, then it's been deemed not to be a detriment to the environment. It's, it's past Title V. No, I understand that, but what I'm saying is, but Title V says, if you need a building permit for new construction and you don't have a COC, your capacity is zero. So again, we're back, we're back to, we're trying to be, I, I know understand we're trying to fit everybody, but it's, and that sterilizes the issue. So all you have is a, pa a passing Title V, which is one out of the three that you were talking about earlier. So. I know, we, I know what you're saying, and I hear you, right? If you have a house on the property, you have the right to continue to work there, but. Yeah, I'm just looking for ways to. I think that's one of them that would come to the, the board. Assist it to move forward. So if you can't, you don't have this, look for this. You don't have this, look for this. Something that dictates that was on there, but it's out of five. Try, I think Trump's all makes sure. it, it just says it's passing, then you can make your decision easier. Say, all right, no problem. Build a house, use the system. I don't think the decision should be left in a, in a situation that's questionable. Probably should come from the, to the board. Well, you could potentially be telling an applicant that um, could have a system that meets the minimum criteria for Title V that, no, they got to spend the 25 grand or whatever it is to put a new system that's a little bit of a problem too. So um, would there be a better system in the ground post new installation? Maybe, but the one that's there may be fine too. Yeah. We came across one in uh, Lakeville. Yeah. Just right there on the, the, the years, I don't even know how many years or how old it was. Right. I can't remember. But in the end, they had to do some minor repairs. And My, the system was working fine. Yeah, brand new house, beautiful house. Yeah, right. So it was a beautiful house they were tearing down and building a new one? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Same flow, same. Uh, yeah. And I'm, that's the way I lean towards it. I, I just, that'll help me make the decision. If sometimes you have to call, like I called the Title V inspector out there to verify the conditions because the, the other one was in question. So I just had, I just, it helped me make a decision. The, home, the homeowner paid for the new Title V inspector, but I was comfortable with that decision. And I've, I've done that um, for several boards of health. That's, it's not gonna be me if, yeah. that, if that happens, but I can tell you that I have worked for many towns in that nature where the town wanted um, uh, Fresh pair of eyes. Support, right. yeah. and, and I came out and evaluated exactly what was on the site, and in the end, they felt more comfortable with moving forward with. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if that's something that you could think about. Yeah, we determined groundwater. That that one was we determined groundwater. I was a witness. Right. I had an inspector, um, third party inspector, right. and you, you, there's different ways to get compliance, and there's different ways to make the decisions. But you already license inspectors, which tells me that you have a process in place to make sure you know who your inspectors are working in this town. You know, there are not a lot of communities that do that. They, so, so I understand why you do that, because there are some inspectors who shouldn't have licenses. I agree. I was going to say that. <laughs> yeah, right. But it's a state license. So, so you've already put that mechanism in place to control your inspectors who are here, or at least vet your inspectors who are here which is good. Um, because
because it does give you some confidence when your inspectors submit reports. Um, if that's not enough for a particular case and it goes to the board, that may be an option that comes out of the board. Yeah. Yeah, I think I kind of agree with that. And, and I think the solution is if there's a situation that becomes extremely debatable, I guess, to the point where it's going to cause a problem, it should come to the board. Um, yeah, and it's know. not going to be that frequent, I'm sure. Uh, every now and then we may come up with it. And uh, we certainly don't want you to stop doing what you're doing by going by Title V. Uh, but I think if there's heavy opposition against a decision, it's probably best to come to the board. You know, um, so I don't know. Has anybody else got any thoughts? Mr. Hall, I know you're thinking about this over there. Uh, you've been listening. Uh, yes, and, and two. One. And I've seen this not only with Board of Health issues, I've seen it with the planning board. In a court of law, who, is, who has the onus on producing government records to prove or disprove the existence of a pre-existing structure, the town or the homeowner? You know, you, you have evidence that a home existed at one point in time in the history of that property. Who has the onus to prove that, that there was a house there? The town or the person that wants to rebuild a structure on that property? And is the Board of Health willing to risk a law and the town risk a lawsuit over something, especially if you have evidence that indicates that there was a prior structure there. My understanding is before, what, 1979? Is it Title V? Yes, 1995. 1995. 1995. Yeah. Um, second question, based on experiences that I've had in the short term that I've been on the board with the amount of Time, legal fees, and political division that it's caused. If it wouldn't be wise just to follow state regs without coming up with something that is more strict. It would be that. I think that's what we finally. Yeah, I, think, I think that's what we decided. We finally just came to... down to leave it alone. I think we're just trying to help the agent and ourselves when this comes along. What are we looking for? Like the owner's going to come to us and say, yeah, the house was there. And you're going to say, well, we don't have record. What do you have for a system? I don't know. Well, again, we're going to permit somebody, something and let somebody occupy a building. So you're saying, oh, who's it fall under? Well, we're going to do everything we can to help that individual. But some responsibility lies on demonstrating something. And that could be hiring a Title V inspector and then in, in conjunction coming up with the ultimate answer. There's no really yes or no. It's working together with the paperwork, trying to figure it out. But um, hopefully there's something in the file. I, I just came up with another good, another point I'd like to. Let's suppose there was a house there. Uh, and you knew it was there, but now it's gone. And you can't find a septic system because they never had one. Uh, we didn't ever have a septic system until 1955 when I was growing up. Yeah, it could have been an outhouse. Correct. Yeah. So there is something what, do you, what do you call that? Just because it's, it's, there's a house there doesn't mean there was a septic there. Yeah, there was a definition for that, privy. So it, would, it doesn't meet compliance, you would have to put a new system in. 
correct? Well, we're back to where we are. No, no, but then... What if they said, yeah, there was a system there? Yeah, they, they, would, have to de they would have to determine there was. Yeah, that's when they... Even with records, they'd say, oh, no, we found out it was a house. I mean, so you would say, yeah, you can do, definitely still build, but now you have to be uh, meet Title V um, standards. So there was an outhouse there. Unless pretty. you can prove there was a system there at one yeah, point. Yeah, you have to demonstrate something. I'm just... Because obviously when you plumb it in, where's it going to go? You're going to have to see something happen. You know, I just put it in the ground. Well, yeah. Right in Chapter 1 of the Building Code, um, I'm required to make sure that you have uh, sanitary services. Yeah. Municipal or a water health approved septic system. So, yeah, they wouldn't even get a building permit unless that would happen. And I understand. I, I know what you're trying to, to, to say. I think it boils down, just to suck it all, to answer your question a little more directly. Um, it always is the, the burden of proof is always on the applicant to provide the documentation that are needed to prove that you either meet pre-existing conditions or protections or not meet pre-existing conditions or protections. And that's only by the available data that we have on our books. But that could be assessor's records, Building files, for the health files. It's on the property owner. All right. It's always on the applicants. It's their responsibility. Okay. Now, if an applicant comes to you with all of this information that they say they found, and the, and the town official says, you know what, that's great. I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not taking it. Well, then you bet the town better have some good information that says otherwise. Otherwise, we have to accept that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we're going to leave it alone. I'm sorry? Yeah. We're going to leave it alone, right? Is that what we've come down well, to well, now? Well, what will happen is, um, I think if there's any debate with me as the agent, that I say we just go to the board and you present your evidence to the board. And yeah, the board you, if you exhausted your resources and you just, it's the difficult, obviously, yeah, come before the board. We're here. Well, we want to hear, we want to hear from the, Applicant and yeah, bring any documentation people, with right? you to prove that there was something here before. Yeah, if we can help and anyone, it, you know what, and it and it saves a lot of turmoil and arguing and so forth. And uh, takes the heat off you. Yeah. yeah, you don't need it. He don't need it. I don't need it. Yeah. So you know, and then the heat's on us. And by great, well. But by bringing it to the board, you're not dealing with one individual. You're dealing with the board, which is yeah. usually three. Um, okay, with somebody else. And, and, and you know what? All three of you uh, don't always agree. You all have different um, viable um, input. And then in the end, the applicant should know that they got, they got a fair uh, listen to it. And whatever the, whatever the will of the board is, is what will happen. I think with the infrequency that it happens, I, I agree with Slack and Hall. I don't I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. That would be least resistance. Right. Okay. I agree. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna move on to inspectors' reports. Uh, pretty, much, agent. pretty much covered everything uh, with the COVID. Um, I had a little backlog of plans and stuff that slowed down a little bit in our office the last couple of weeks on the amount of calls coming in. Um, so I'm kind of getting caught up on that, but um, I don't think I have anything right now to report. Things are getting a little better now that we have the nurse and you're doing 35 hours. Yeah, I'm up, I'm full time. Um, so that seven hours is starting to make a difference, but it's going to be a little while. But yeah, the nurse, um, she's, she's doing all the contact tracing now. So tomorrow morning, we're going to be closing out follow-up calls from the ones that we have been followed. Because she's only been doing it for 10 days now, so we're at the end of our people. And um, yeah, I should get a weekend off. Both of us should, so it should be nice. Nice. Yeah, Do some okay. Christmas shopping. I think I might. I doubt I'll have the whole weekend off, I'm assuming we'll be some calls in there, but yeah. Oh, 
you always get a call on weekends for something. The building commissioner. Yeah, I, I know it's late. I promise I won't take much of your time. I wanted to bring you uh, in the loop on something that's been brewing for a few years with uh, tiny homes. I'm sure we've all seen them on TV. So a couple of years ago, the ICC, which is the International Code Commission, approved what's called Appendix Q, which gives leniency to tiny homes and exempts them from certain building code requirements, such as rise and run out of stairs, headroom, emergency escape window openings, et cetera, et cetera. We, as a state, have not adopted the version of the ICC that allows tiny homes as right. We're still in a pre-existing, uh, I'm sorry, an older version of the code, which does allow it. I anticipate the state will eventually adopt it, and Appendix Q will be in full force, and these structures will probably come out, because, let's face it, they're pretty economical, uh, they're easy to build, et cetera, et cetera. So the thing that I see coming up on the horizon is these things are usually one bedroom, very small, some like to be off the grid. I'm going to need this board to come up with something before the code gets adopted as to how we're going to deal with sanitary sewer. Because I can guarantee they're going to either come in and want to do composting toilets or uh, maybe ask for, I don't even know if it's allowed, waivers from Title V for the three bedrooms. Um, because a three bedroom system just is, is it would be absorbent for a tiny home. Um, so I just want to put that on your radar. Right now, according to our bylaws, they would still have to have a buildable lot to put these on. We don't allow two structures on one lot. And we don't have any um, smaller lot sizes for tiny homes. It would still need the, the normal buildable lot. But I can't anticipate that if the state adopts this code and um, they become uh, mainstream, then there might be pressure on planning boards to um, reduce the lot sizes and pressure on boards of health to try to figure out a way to make it a little bit easier for these things to come in. So right now, if someone wants to build a tiny home with or without Appendix Q, the only exceptions are from the Mass State Building Code. I'm still going to require a buildable lot in the zoning bylaw definition, and I'm still going to require a septic system through the Board of Health, which means a three-bedroom septic system minimum. So I can see this becoming a problem down the road. Jared, oh. and so, so Title V does allow you to do less than a three-bedroom as long as you put a feed restriction on the property. Yeah, so I've seen still that. be a 1,500-gallon tank, but the leaching field would just be a third Even the size. Even new construction? Yeah. Yeah. And, then and you can actually put it now. You can actually put a tight tank if you want to, right? Yeah, no, it, I, 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 yeah. You have to prove that you can't put a septic on the lot. The composting it's toilets true, are yeah. allowed. Yeah. So composting toilets are allowed already. So. It's true. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. Okay. So they, they. Just nobody wants them generally for a three bed or a four bed or colonial or whatever. They yeah. would prefer a conventional septic. Presently, they could do a conservation. Well, they don't. The state doesn't allow, but they could do a conservation subdivision with tiny houses on 7,500 square feet. If a developer wanted to come in, yeah, that's that would be up to a developer. But there hasn't been a lot of interest in that, and I've only received a couple calls through the years. Um, but you know, I, I think once the state adopts the the appendix Q, which gives them some relief, because right now it's hard to make a title uh, a tiny home building code compliant. It's nearly impossible. Because if you put the rise and run for a stairwell to get to the loft, you lose half the building. So that's why Appendix Q was adopted to give them leniencies to do like the ship type ladders and steep inclines. And then of course in the loft is usually the sleeping area. There's no bedroom window up there for the emergency escape opening. So that's why Appendix Q was adopted. I don't even know if this state will adopt it without um, amendments. You know, they, they, may, they may try to amend it. So we'll see. You know, we'll see what, what comes down the pike. But um, the deed restriction is, is interesting. It makes sense. But now I have a, uh, an almost one acre lot with 175 feet of frontage with a tiny home that's deed restricted for one bedroom. So, you know, we need to make sure that the public's aware of what that means. Because if they want to knock the tiny home down and put a big house up, it's not going to happen. Well, they would, always, they would have to revise, uh, 
They'd have to put a new new system. New construction. Yeah. Yeah. I want that they be considered affordable units because of the size. Yeah, I don't know. So you're already putting in a two bedroom system, might as well put in a three bedroom system. Right. Yeah, and that'll be up to the app. And then you could always uh I just wanna let you know it's coming. I'm I have, I'm getting some calls, but it, it's not like the I would say after living one year in a house like that, then I'd say let's build again. <laughs> I couldn't do it. That's to me personally. They're, they're small. Yeah. Yeah, not for a long period of time. Anything else? No, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the animal inspector is in here. We're going into public input. I have three items. Three items. Okay. All positive. Okay, good. The first one. In the very short time that Nicole Mello has been on the Board of Health, the Board of Selectmen has received very impressive praise of her efforts. Uh, the second item, because of the recent upsurge of COVID cases in Dighton, Town Administrator Mike Mullen today sent a letter of appeal to Representative Pat Haddad and Senator Mark Pacheco requesting a return of CARES Act funds to the Town of Dighton. We were required at the end of October to return funds that were unused. He is asking, almost as an emergency Good. need, for additional funding. The third item, and I say this not as one member of the Board of Selectmen, I say this as a unified Board of Selectmen. As Mr. Pius is aware, for at least two years, the town has talked about creating a contract for health agent Todd Pilling. It is our goal that by the end of this fiscal year that a contract be in place for Todd Pilling. And Mr. Pires and Mr. Pilling, I understand tomorrow at 9 a.m. we have a meeting. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not part of that meeting. No. No? Oh, okay, Mr. Pires. Um, it's time that we put together a schedule and start contract negotiations. Yeah, I'm um, totally um, on board with that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Any other public input? <laughs> Correspondence. I guess we have a thank you, if you to Borges Brothers Trucking. You don't need a microphone, right? No. I didn't think so. Let's see the card that came in the mail. Um, well, to Borges, and he shared it with us. Thank you very much for being my friend and always waving to me over the years. I'm starting school this year in September, so I won't be home as much to see and wave to you every week. My baby sister will continue to wave to you on trash day each week, and I'll be sure to wave and say hello on the days I'm home from school. Kind of makes you teary, doesn't it? Kind of does. <laughs> it's nice to get some good news in the yeah. time it seems like we'll be seizing them all five. Yeah, we're, uh, we're lucky to have Borges trucking out there on the streets because Talking about going over above and beyond, uh, I think they, every once in a while, we'll get a call of missed uh, trash or recycles, but that's rare. And we're not sure if the person put it out in time or what happened with it, but however it happened, they'll go back and get it. So, you know, if you have a situation where you want to get rid of your bags just call our office we'll call them and they're usually pretty good about it so yeah and i'd just like to add you talk about consistency like you don't know for sure when your meal is going to come or whatever but on friday morning 8 a.m that truck is coming by my yeah it's like clockwork it's unbelievable and i'm always the last one running out there with the truck okay we do have another piece of correspondence that uh, is from our sustainable 
Materials Recovery Program. It was a grant award that we've been receiving for the last few years for our recycling initiatives that we have. Uh, I'll just, this came from the Department of Environmental Protection. I went to the chair of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, I'm going to read the first paragraph. The other respite is uh, just pretty much the history of it. But congratulations. It is my pleasure to inform you that Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, also known as Mass DEP, has awarded the Town of Dighton Recycling Dividends Program funds under the Sustainable Materials Recovery Program. The Town of Dighton has earned eight points and will receive $4,800. Um, it's through the effort of everybody that we're uh, moving along with the recycling. There's still a lot, long way to go. Uh, tra well, tr I was watching a webinar the other day from uh, Materials Recovery Program that trash has gone way up, and I think everybody uh, was on the same page that most, most in part, trash has gone up in all communities uh, due to people at home from COVID. Uh, but they're still trying to cut at 30, 30% in the next 10 years, so that means more recycling. Uh, so the more you can recycle, the more we appreciate it. Uh, actually, trash is cheaper to get rid of than recycling at this point. It's crazy. Uh, so don't put it in the trash, but because uh, then trash will probably go up. But anyway, <laughs> uh, you know, it's something we try to get every year. We, we're in there for the points, and, and it's not a lot of money, but Every every dollar counts when we're trying to meet budget in the town. So what can what can we use it for? Can we use it for that? Um, the reason I just gave this to you, gentlemen, page two, um, the second highlighted portion near the bottom, it says a municipality is allowed one special spending request per year for an item not found on the approved spending list. So I just wanted to give this to you to think about a different way, or we can ask to see if we can spend this differently than. Previously, we've gotten roll-offs, we've prepared for roll-offs, we've got some other. Maybe we could put this funds towards starting the swap shed. I know. Or, or yeah. buying a propane recovery system. I, I pre I'd like to do the recycling audit <coughs> myself. Okay, well, there's a different idea. So I thought about the recycling audit, which is part of the, uh, yeah, well, we, the tool, tool, IT toolbox there, or whatever yeah. it is. And uh, at least you can give us a handle on where the problems are. And maybe. So moving forward, I believe the uh, our price of our disposal is going to be tied to our percentage of contamination in our trash. So anything over 10% contamination is going to be an extra percent that you're going to be paying on your increase. So it's going to behoove us to be under 10% in the next few years when we have to re-up the CMS. And it's going to take a while to get to that point. So starting sooner rather than later, we need to know where we're starting. Also, the, the kit, then. We have to make sure we're cleaning up, right? What are you saying? That's a whole yeah. recycling IQ thing. I know, but that takes a lot of man hours. Well, it does, but did we get a, uh, did we ever get uh, the letter sorry, out? Yeah, you know what I mean. Did we ever get the letter out to the Board of Selectmen recommending that we should have a solid waste committee? We have not done that yet. Okay. That's what we have discussed before, solid waste committee, to go, uh, because it's, it's getting more and more complex, and I think we need to find the more oh, yeah. minds, the better to, uh, Especially with the rules that are coming But we're out. going to be sending it out to you, I hope, soon. <laughs> new rules are rolling out November 1st of next year about textiles, which we're already doing the pink bags and mattresses and stuff. So yeah. we're, we're, we're ahead of the curve at the moment, but we need to stay there. Yes, yeah. definitely. Okay. Anything else? You move on. Approval of minutes. Uh, their motion approved the minutes of September 30, October 14, and November 18, all of 2021. So moved. 
Motion's made. I'll step down. Motion was made by Mr. Bernardo. Mr. Fires is going to step down to second it. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Mr. Bernardo votes aye. Aye by Mr. Fires. Motion to adjourn. Motion made to adjourn by Mr. Bernardo. Uh, Mr. Fires is going to step down to second the motion. So all in favor? Aye. Mr. Bernardo as an aye. Mr. Fires is an aye. Thank you everyone for watching. Thank you Cable. Thank you Mr. Hull.